My name is Jill Guthrie. I'm a digital manager for Wilmot Dixon. Um, I don't know if anyone has heard of Wilmot Dixon or you know, anything about construction as such. Um, I feel like I was a little bit of a wild card with all of you tech guys by saying construction's gonna come in, but I feel a bit more relieved now because we seem to have the same problems as what you guys are having, which is great. Um, so I'm gonna, I've kind of broken my slides into three, if you like, so, three, so the first part of it is gonna be um, talking a little bit about the industry and why we're digitizing it, how we're doing that. Then I'm gonna show you um, a case study which is how we've digitized a specific um, project which has got several different tenants, uh, different prop tech tenants in there. And then um, we're gonna talk a little bit about our Eureka Fund which is where the, um, the vest has come from. So, um, for those of you who don't know, Wilmot Dixon, we're um, a family-owned business, one of the largest in the UK, and um, the majority of you, well, pretty much everyone, will live very close to one of our sites. Uh, we work across all different sectors, so we do have housing, um, blue light, MOJ, um, pretty much every, every different sector. Um, so... Why are we trying to digitize the industry? For those of you who have worked in construction, you'll know that um, it's probably one of the most wasteful um, industries you can work in. We're not efficient. Um, this 20% of every project is rework. And with that, um, I found this awful statistic that someone was presenting um, a few weeks ago pointed out that um, construction in terms of digitizing the industry is actually lower than fishing. And I don't know a single thing about fishing, but I know that we should probably be doing better than the fishing industry. Um, this is why we're trying to sort out the construction industry. So a little bit of a boring slide for you, but it's quite important. Um, back in 2011, the government um, issued a construction strategy document. Within that document, it said, we need to reduce waste by 50%. Um, it had loads of, loads of sort of different things we've got to do as an industry, which we can only do by digitizing it. Um, within that document, that was the first time that BIM was mentioned. I don't, does anyone know what BIM is? Does anyone not know? It might be easier saying if you don't know. So what it stands for is building information modeling. And what that means is um, in the, the old school, I don't want to say old school because it might offend a few people, but back in the day, um, you would have your 2D information, you'd have your drawing boards. Um, now, um, everything's modeled in 3D. Uh, with that 3D model, we can then collect data, very specific data on how that building's going to be maintained. Um, that data can plug into um, facilities management platform, and that's how you can start to manage your building more efficiently. So we're now working in a 3D environment, but with that comes um, lots of challenges in terms of processes. Um, we have so many different standards that have been created since 2011, all the way up to the mandate for government centrally, centrally procured government projects have to be delivered in a BIM environment. There's different levels to it, which I won't go into at the moment. So when the BIM mandate arrived in 2016 for centrally procured projects, the, the previous couple of years before that scene, all of these different standards that we have to work to, and basically trying to, trying to digitize the industry is hard enough, but trying to get people to use and manage the flow of information is probably the most difficult thing I've ever come across. Um, so that is part of the process of all of this. So um, if I skip on to um, end of December last year, beginning of January this year, the standards that the UK created have been are now moved over into an international standard, which shows the amount of work that the UK has put in is actually now is, is fantastic. It's been recognized nationally. So, so that's a small part of it. So BIM is all of the process, the flow of information. What we then have is the digital side, which is a lot more exciting. So lots of images on the screen. I'll briefly run through some of them. So in the top uh, right-hand side, we've got um, immersive environments. So you've probably all seen these in some form, maybe in gaming situations. This is where we walk our customers into the building and we can start to look at clash detection. So if we've got some m and &E that's clashing with uh, the structural frame, we can start to talk to you, um, the consultants and we can start to el eliminate it. Um, we have, um, we're using a lot of um, 
laser scan surveys. I don't know if any of you have ever seen them before. Um, go around the building, scan it, and then we can use it for construction verification. So if you're partway through um, a building on site, um, we can go around, we can scan it, and we can clash detect that against the, the, the actual model that has been built off. Um, so again, we're trying to reduce error and waste. Um, we have got the vest, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Drones, which we're starting to use more and more. Um, hopefully not too close to any of the airports, but we're trying to find a way that we can use them within the industry, whether it be one of the projects we used it for was just for communication. Um, the project I'm going to talk about in a few minutes was, in, uh, was based in Anglesey. Um, they're very protective about Anglesey, people who live on Anglesey, and rightly so. Uh, so we just did drone footage every month to show them the progress, and they absolutely loved it. They bought into the project because we're keeping them informed. But there's lots more exciting things you can do with drones than just that. Um, um, and more and more, this image, are just, just a data image, basically. We're now seeing buildings being designed using, um, using data with complex structures. I believe there's an architect actually going to speak later, so I'll leave that, leave that to you. Um, so this is, we take, we take what we do very seriously in Wilmot Dixon. We want to be seen as the forefront of digitizing the industry. And we've got um, very structured teams within the business. Um, we've got um, a head of digital for construction and a head of digital for um, interiors. Then you have myself who looks after the northern region. I head up all of that. And then below, we've got a team of digital engineers. And we've also got um, Chris Johnson, who'll come on stage in a moment. And he heads up the Midlands team. Um, so he'll picks up this patch. Um, yeah, so just a bit of a brief um, slide on our structure. Now, if I just go back to the processor side a bit, there's a whole accreditation aspect to this. So we are, as Wilmot Dixon, are accredited to deliver BIM projects. And with that comes lots of auditing, which is pretty boring, but it's really important. Um, a part of what we have to do, I've just put an image on, which basically documents the majority of what we get audited on. The, the key things to note on here is our own organizational requirements. So our customers have theirs. They want, to, they want to know different parts of the building, different elements of that building, the data for that part of the, ele that part of the building, and how they're going to maintain it. As a contractor, we want to know Unfortunately, if I refer back to Grenfell, we need to know where that panel, if we've used it, where we've used it, where that site is, where that project is. We need to know all of that data and we need to know it instantly. So we need to be able to track the materials across our projects. So that's where we're starting to look at our own organizational requirements, um, as well as just the customers. So what, what we really need to do is we need to get the likes of you guys involved right at early stages. I know Nigel mentioned it um, when he was talking that the sooner we get you involved, the better it is for the project, rather than retrospectively bringing you in, trying to fit in some of your information. Part of the problem we found was, it's a little bit of a blurry image that, but um, <clears throat> We have so many different systems, not just within Wilmot Dixon, the industry as a whole. Um, to be able to find out if we're actually making efficiencies on these projects, none of the information talks to each other, which is a logistical nightmare when we're trying to say we've saved X amount on this project because of these different variables. So we created um, what's called a My Project platform. And within there, this is implemented on every project. There's um, a training element to it. There's a health and safety element to it. So we can track and log if there's any accidents on site. Um, there's an aftercare for our customers. So if they have any um, defects, they can plug it into the platform and it reads across a project wide. So we can have a look at um, if there's been more accidents on one project, we can check the, lo the log for the train and have they been trained correctly. Um, if there's lots of defects, why the lo why are there lots of defects? Is it because we didn't have enough people on site, there was too many accidents? So it helps us collate lots of data. And just very briefly, again, these images are very blurry. Um, this is our digital landscape. So these, anything that's green are the, te the technologies that we're testing, or are using, sorry, anything that's orange we're testing, anything that's gray we haven't yet moved into. So when we looked at this a year ago, it was probably half of that was, half of what's green was, was gray or orange. So we're making really good step, steps at the moment. So I'm going to talk to you very briefly 
about how we implement all of that onto an actual project. Um, this is taken from the 3D model that the consultants provided, um, and it's a innovation center on Anglesey, so lots of different startup tech companies um, all want to be able to manage their own sort of space. Um, they can grow within that space. Specialist labs are in there. Um, the biggest problem we had on this project was we have lots of specific, very specific KPIs. The biggest one on this project was the customer wanted to have as much local spend within our supply chain as possible. I don't know if you've ever been to Bang uh, Bangor or Anglesey. It's not a big place. There's not a huge amount of supply chain there. So we spent months upon months of upskilling, training through workshops, um, very so generic workshops. Then we do project-specific workshops, just looking at data. As an M&E consultant, we need you to provide data on all of this. This is what the data is. This is what it's going to be used for. This is how you can then use it for future use. Um, and with that, we managed to spend $9 million, which we're really impressed with because it took a lot of work to get that nine million. Um, but now because of, because of all that upskilling, there's a whole supply chain in North Wales now that can now deliver projects to this level. Um, one of the biggest problems we have is M&E. Um, nothing to do with mechanical and electrical engineers as such. It's just the amount of information that we need from them and the amount of data. Um, we checked on this project after once we'd handed it over, we tested it against a similar size project, which was traditional, so all 2D, um, and we reduced requests for information by 63% because we're asking for more information up front, we're getting them involved earlier, um, and we're eliminating so many issues before we actually get to site. Um, so digital takeoff, um, this is a really big win for us. Um, so this, the image that you can see is a steel fabrication model and it's color coded based on um, the weight of the steel. Um, we, the, the surveyor did this um, in eight days, manual approach took eight days. Um, we tested it alongside and it took us three hours. This huge amount of savings in that for us just by clicking a few buttons, a little bit more sophisticated than that, but compared to what the surveyor does, we literally just clicked a few buttons. So again, another great win for us. Um, I'm not the biggest fan personally of VR headsets. I find them really gimmicky. I'm just not into gaming and you put a headset on and some customers really like it. Some of them feel sick. Um, I, tr I try and keep away from them unless there's a specific need for them and there was on this project. But instead of throwing all of our money at it, buying really expensive kit, we just used a two pound pair of Google cardboard glasses. Um, that was it. Um, and we had another KPI. We had a target of 15% occupancy on this project um, before handover or at handover. Um, we built on this side of the site cabins, we built a little viewing platform. We had our two three pound cardboard goggles with popped our phone in and we let them let our, let the different stakeholders and potential tenants just have a look at the space they were interested in. That was it. There wasn't any fancy technology involved in it. Um, and with that, it secured 37% occupancy two months before handover, which is absolutely brilliant. And it kind of shows you don't have to spend loads of money on all of this amazing tech. I know this is a tech event. It's great, but it doesn't always have to be that way. Um, <clears throat> Now this platform, the customer had, um, has a facilities management platform, but they wanted to take it a step further and they wanted to look at the energy efficiency of the building. They wanted to see which of their tenants is using too much energy. Um, they have um, photovoltaics outside. They wanted to plug the BMS system into that. And there wasn't a solution out there readily available. The BMS system, I'm not an expert at all on BMS systems, but they can show you in plan view some information, but it wasn't interactive and not everyone has access to it. Um, so what, what our customer wanted on this was screens around the building that will show you or show the tenant how much energy they're using in their particular rooms. So we, we worked with a tech company who have no experience whatsoever in construction, never worked in construction, um, and they came up with this fantastic platform where we give them the 3D models, all of the asset information's in there, and then they could create a traffic light system. These screens are around, um, around the building. If it's red, they're using too much energy. Green, energy efficient. Orange, they might want to have a little look at what they're doing. And we're looking to roll this out across um, lots of our other projects within the business because it's been so successful. Lots of lessons learned on that as well that we didn't know at the time 
when we were engaging with the BMS platform that we were going to do this. There was a few problems linking it to it, so we ended up actually fitting sensors. So now we know, going back on future projects, we need to have the BMS platform um, engaged much sooner. Some of the challenges I've probably talked about as I've gone on, but I think procurement's one of the biggest ones within the industry. Um, we're not, if it's a two-stage tender or um, if we're, if we're in detailed design, we're still not getting the information soon enough. We're not engaging with our supply chain quick enough. And um, there's not very much, or well, I've, there's no policing basically from local authorities on the information we're handing over. They don't have the infrastructure yet to be able to receive all of this information, so that's a bit of a problem. Um, the future, you could probably tell me this more than me tell you. Um, I think, um, I don't know a huge amount about blockchain, but I think if we can get smarter with contracts and if we can link some of this information um, to payments, better payments, that'll be much better for our supply chain. Um, lots more wearable technology. We are starting to see it in magazines, but we're not quite seeing it on site yet. So there's lots of hard hat technology where you're seeing augmented reality on site. So you can see where you need to start setting out information on site, which is great, but we're just not seeing it move quick enough onto site. And very quickly to finish, Chris is going to come on stage and model our ESCO vest very kindly. So we have um, in Wilmot Dixon, we've got a Eureka Fund, and this is a research and development fund. Um, and how it works is um, you submit, you have to identify a problem first. That problem, the purpose of the fund was to identify a problem by anyone within the business, literally anyone. We didn't want it to be just senior managers or just directors. We wanted the management trainees to find a problem because they're much younger. They've got a different vision to us. Um, I say that as if we're really old, but you know, they, they, they come from a different generation, so they, they, they see different ideas that we don't necessarily see, so it's open to anyone. Um, there's no monetary cap on it, and so far we've pretty much had, I think we've had 12, um, 12 ideas that have been pushed through, and this was one of them. So I, th I believe that someone went on holiday to America, seeing this was being used, and we bought one and we're testing it out across the entire business. How does it feel? <laughs> Very strange. <laughs> yes. um, it, it's okay down here. There's not much uh, push or uh, resistance, but as soon as you start lifting your arms... Throws your arms up. Um, <clears throat> and I understand it's meant for repetitive activities uh, when you're working at high mm -hmm. like that. So it extends somebody's working out in the jewel room, it's just it's better than I do, but I believe it extends potentially when you're working mm -hmm. above your head, um, above head um, it can you can get tired after an hour, just to extend it, your working capabilities up to the whole day, and still not have tired arms yeah. afterwards. Yeah, there's a bit of um, we there's been lots of marketing around this, and part of it was um, your body gets destroyed when you're working on site for 20, 25 years. It's not good for you physically. So we're trying to find ways around that. So it's not necessarily a digital tool, but it's still wearable technology that's really solving a lot of problems. And that's it. Thank you.